So come aboard and bring along all your podcast friends. Together we will talk about all their movie scores. There's always room for shows and maybe all them dash gun games. We are, we are NMI. When you need more info. <laughs> Not gonna lie, people, that was the uh, best attempt I've ever actually given at doing one of these, to be honest. And if you can tell, I kind of butchered the lyrics to probably the best anime manga selling series of all time, One Piece. Speaking of One Piece, that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today, the new Netflix One Piece show. But before we get into that, hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Nate, I'm the host of NMI When You Need More Info, and it's going to be a solo venture today. So obviously, you know, we do these podcast episodes where we do discussional topics, movie reviews, game discussions, TV, TV ideas, top lists and everything. But you know, everyone's quite busy today, so I decided, you know, I'm going to take the reins and actually catch us up on some movie reviews, TV reviews that we've not gone around to, or I've just been able to do with it while the other crew. Uh, busy so right again it's always good, good, good to be back people so obviously today we are going to be talking about Blue Beetle yes that's the new uh, DC movie that's come out re- recently with uh, Shola Maradwenya. Uh we are also going to be talking about the recent Seth Rogen uh, animated TMNT movie and we are going to be talking about the NMI uh, sorry the NMI the Netflix the Netflix adaptation for One Piece so when it comes to these um, movies and TV shows it's, it's going to be interesting because like, obviously, one of these series is done a lot more well than the others. We're talking TMNT here because, like, can you... Even with the live-action TMNT movies, they weren't terrible. They were okay, but they they weren't terrible. And usually with the animated shows and animated movies, they have really a huge audience. And it's been going around for, like, 35 years by this point. But when it comes to Blue Beetle... Yeah, that's going to be an interesting story because obviously we have the whole DC controversy with James Gunn and how, like, when it comes to DC at the moment, where is the world? Where is the world at, at the moment? We're not in the Snyderverse anymore. We're not in the Gunverse at the moment. But Blue Beetle seems to be in this way, weird grey area that I'm not going to lie. We'll get into the review for it, but there's some interesting talking points regarding that. And funny, yeah, we talk about One Piece. How does this adaptation hold up? Like, obviously we have the anime that's out that's like... 1070 episodes by now we've got the best selling manga of all time probably one of the best animes of all time been going since 1997 but how does it compare because obviously netflix really hasn't done well with their anime adaptations but i'm talking definite full metal alchemist uh, full metal alchemist they did full metal alchemist and also obviously cowboy bebop which uh we didn't do a re- i believe we did a- yes we did a review for that i believe so please go listen to that episode where we did back in the day So, obviously, you know, with NMI, what we do is we tend to give a review and a spoiler discussion, but today we're only just going to be doing reviews. Each section will be split into mini review sections, and we'll have a little um, transition period between those. Please look for the audio log if you just want to, so the audio code, if you want to just skip to the next section. So, I think, uh, you know, usually we do a bit of an intro here with each person, but, like, I've been good this week. I hope everyone's been great out there. It's very hot weather in the UK, and we're definitely trying to get this out of the way right now. If you do hear cars in the background, people, the windows are open a little bit, because I do not want to die from dehydration. But I think it's time, people, that we talk about our first review this evening, which I think, or this evening when I'm recording this, I think we need to talk about Blue Beetle, the recent adaptation from DC, uh, directed by Angel Manuel Soto and starring Sholo Maradwenya, uh, Adriana Barraza and George Lopez, Susan Sarandon, and a whole slew of other actors. When it comes to this movie, how do we begin? Well, just to get out of there first, people, we're, we're going to do Blue Beetle, TMNT, and then finish with One Piece. So yeah, let's get back to Blue Beetle, though. So, how does this film compare to the recent stuff we've had? So I'm not going to lie, I saw The Flash, I gave that movie a 7, and I'm not going to lie, I think I gave that rating a too high for that movie, because... Revisiting the movie, seeing how it is, I think it's a six at best. I really do. Maybe a five. Because I think some of the actors in the movie do do a good what with what they have available. And I think um the director, he did the best he could. You know, the flash went through so many rewrites, so many re you know, reinventions and how it went. But we're coming to Blue Beetle now, which is the sort of the he is the official start point of the new DCU. James Gunn has come out and stated that you no know, Blue Beetle is actually the first DC character that's going to be transitioning over to the DCU, not the Gunverse, just the DCU. But he's not the official like narrative movie. Superman is going to be the first inclusion of all those characters in 2025. Well, that was the date, obviously, with the writer's strike going on at the moment. 
But how does Blue Beetle fare? Obviously, you know, this movie was supposed to be a TV movie on HBO Max. And when people hear that, they'll go, oh, it's going to be a TV budget. Like, you know, the CGI is not going to be great. The acting is going to be subpar. And I'm not going to lie. Uh, the villains in this movie are very basic villains. Like, I think we do get a slight interesting backstory with one of the villains. I, I wish that was a you know, sort of grown out a bit more but we don't really get that with Susan Sarandon's main character Victoria Cord who is the sister of Ted Cord one of the first Blue Beetles it seems like this movie is going in a lot of people have compared this to a early phase one Iron Man movie like you know it's it's introducing this world like you know it, it's, it's giving us the basic story of like you know the good version versus the evil version and how that goes and everything but before we dive into that, let's let's give a, a, a small premise of the movie. So basically, this stars uh, Jaime Reyes as um, the Blue Beetle, uh, Sholo Maraduena as Jaime Reyes, just left college, he's coming back home to his family, and he meets his friend one day, played by, uh, I'm trying to find her name here, Bruna Marg... Quinya, uh, Marquinia, Z, I hope I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, I do apologise, as Jenny Cord. She plays uh, the daughter of Ted Cord and also J Jaime's uh, love interest. And uh, yeah, this is going to be interesting because, you know, she's given he's given this uh, burger box and he's told not to open it. And of course, the inquisitive person he is, he opens it and finds a alien scarab inside, which grafts to him and like gives him this like exoskeleton but also it, he it morphs with him essentially think Giver back in the day like i think that's the best way to look at it obviously blue beetle became more prominent in the young justice series that came out in recent years uh the animated series for young justice and i thought it was a great like interpretation of the character if you've seen that show i'm hoping we get the conclusion of that character because there's this whole storyline with his character specifically and how the beetle plays into it and I'm hoping that does play into it going forward. But a big part of this movie is the family, the superhero aspect, and how it plays out compared to other DC films. We talked about the budget very briefly. The budget doesn't really show as bad as people think. Like, The Flash had a $200, $300 million budget. And the CGI is quite bad in that movie. Like, it's really quite bad. But uh, the director, Angel uh, Manuel Soto, has actually come out and stated that he didn't want to overwork his VFX artists. And also, he tried to go for as much practical as possible. And that really shows in the suit that Sholo wears. Like, the Blue Beetle suit, I feel, is a is an astounding creation. And props to the, um you know... Oh, apologies i'm going to mute my phone there but props to the actual you know designers of the shoot so just looking through wikipedia here you know because you've got to find those good names sometimes props to the creator myers c rubio and the team from 9b collective so basically they were inspired by again young justice and injustice um but like i'm just reading it here so they were trying to because obviously with the blue beetle suit they tried to do a deadpool effect where his mouth moves and the eyes are inter interact and everything and they do an excellent job. Like, I think this is one of the best comic book accurate suits we've had in quite a while. Obviously, we have our Spider-Mans, we our Iron Mans, Doctor Strangers, like Marvel specifically. Batman has always been a mixed bag. I think the Batflex suit is perfect in my eyes. Like, the first Batflex suit. Um, but they've done an amazing job here. And I feel that when uh, Jaime does first get the suit on, it's like a horror sequence. It's absolutely brutal. Like... It, it feel it feels like a horror movie, like a, like a body snatchers type thing, and but the, it literally switches from horror, like or you know thriller, like you know taking over a body, to this comedic sequence of like the the, the suit essentially initiating itself. Uh, obviously, we see this in the trailer. I'm not going to go into any more spoilers there, but I wanted to. I you know. I think that Sholo Maraduena does an amazing job in this movie. Obviously, we know him from Cobra Kai, and uh, I, I, was, I was a massive fan of him in Cobra Kai. I think I saw the starting of a great, a great leading actor, and I think the fact that I believe he was one of the first people that that was like, you know, he oh yes, he he was one of pretty much the first choice for Jaime Reyes, and I could definitely see that in the movie because he has he has charm, he has wit, he has charisma. You know, he plays off every other actor really well. He does comedic, he does comedy extremely well. He does. He does. He does. He, he he shows emotion in his eyes quite a bit in this film, and I can't wait to see what he does next. I'm kind of hoping that a lot of people have mixed this to Spider Man and Iron Man. So like the suit design, but more the character of Spider Man, and I'm hoping he becomes like the one of the central parts of the DCU going forward. 
uh, obviously, you know, Superman is the first big DC movie out of the gate and then Batman. But I feel take advantage of Blue Beetle. This Latino led superhero movie because like with, uh, with other films and TV shows that have come out in recent years, uh, specifically with Miss Marvel, the family dynamic in that show w- was really praised. And it also shows in this movie, like from the get go, um, this movie, you, you come to really appreciate this family. Like uh, we'll go through the actors here. So Adriana Barraza as Nana, uh, Damien Alcaza as Alberto, the father. Uh, we also have, um, I'm just going through the names here. Apologies. El Padilla Carrillo as uh, the mother. George Lopez as Jamie's uncle, uh, Jaime's uncle. I think she does a great job. And also um, one big standout I feel in this film is uh, Belissa Escobeda. I do pronounce, I do apologize if I butcher these names in the the review people, but it's not intentional. She does an excellent balance off of Jaime in this movie because like she's a bit of the, you know, the slack, you know, she, she didn't go to college, she didn't go to university, stuff like that. But she really sticks by her family. She really sticks by her brother. And, but you see the brother sister dynamic, which is really fun to see. Because obviously in this film, we deal with Susan Sarandon's character, who is the sister of Ted Cord. And I feel like only realizing this now, you see the balance between um, the Ted Cord and Susan Sarandon character, Victoria Cord characters, like the the clash between them. Whereas the Jaime and um, uh, as uh, Mel- Melgro, um, Jaime's younger sister, we see the excellent dynamic between them. I do think uh, two standouts, well, three standouts in the movie are Jaime's father, uncle played by George Lopez, and the grandmother. I do think. Um, like, this movie is quite emotional at points. Like, I was actually tearing up at a couple of points, specifically with the family. Like, it really, from the, it really, it really early on builds this, right, family dynamic for this relationship that you really get invested in this family. So when, you know, stuff happens later in the movie, you, you, you feel for them. You, you feel like you're, you are, feel like you're part of the family to a degree. And it's portrayed so well. Obviously, we have George Lopez's Rudy Reyes as, like, this, um, conspiracy theorist. Which is heavily, is heavily hilarious because obviously you know you hear about how like, you know he's the Batman. You know he thinks Batman's a fascist, which I think was hilarious in the film. It's an off, you know, it's an off tone and everything, but it's played off really well. Um, the Nana character, played by Adriana Barraza, she has an interesting uh, story going in the film, and I do like the fact that you know towards the third act of the movie she has like some interesting dynamics with us, the rest of the family. Um, but Alberto Reyes, uh, played by Damien Alcaza, I feel that he has a great relationship with uh, Sholo's character. And sometimes in movies, you, you feel like, oh, it's just a TV movie. They're, p- they're just playing off each other. Like, you know, it's not really, you're not really feeling the dynamic between them. But I think with Sholo's character and um, as uh, what Jaime and uh, Alberto, you really feel the dynamic of father and son as, as someone who's dealt with, you know, issues like that before. It really tugged at the heartstrings, to be honest. Like, it really did. And the power of his character really drives Jaime forward. And I think it's it's a great way. It, I think then DC needs to focus on family and great relationship dynamics. Because I feel that a lot of other films and superhero films are a bit becoming disconnected now. And you're not feeling the connection between characters. Miss Marvel really did show us the connection between the family. And I think if like, I think when it comes to like, you know, going forward, sorry, I coughed a bit there, got a bit of a a croaky throat, people. When it comes to movies going forward, Marvel changed the dynamic of shifting from superhero movies to genre movies, you know, Winter Soldier, for example. But I think when it comes to Blue Beetle and Miss Marvel, they're showing us the the family dynamic. We got the Guardians of the Galaxy a little bit to a degree, but it wasn't a true family. It's like a family that came together. This is a true family. So... Let's talk, let's talk about the CGI in the movie. You know, it, again, this was meant to be a TV movie on HBO budget, and it doesn't show. Like, it's a great... I think the VFX, a lot of the VFX in this movie are great for what they do use. And there's a couple of sequences in this film which you could compare them to Marvel movies, and I think they're doing an outstanding job. Like, I think some of the... I do. I will admit, some of the earlier parts of the movie, like, I don't like... I don't really like the UI of um uh, the blue beetle outfit like the, what what um what Jaime sees through the suit I think it's too too cartoony I think like it could have been tweaked a little bit it was too it was too colorful like I know it's weird to say it's too colorful but when you see the movie you probably know what I'm going on about uh obviously like you know the movie comes with an entity called uh Kaji Da played by um voice actress uh, voiced by uh Becky G who is a American singer and actress 
Uh, I do like, you know, she she's very like, you know, she is the um, she's the suit a voice like, you know, uh, like Spider-Man and Iron Man have basically. But they have an interesting dynamic between between uh, Jaime and um, the suit, because obviously, like he's a teenager. He doesn't want to kill. Definitely plays into the movie. And I think it I think there's an excellent dynamic there, to be honest. Obviously, you know, speak about the family, uh, the the VFX of the movie. Let's talk about the pacing of the film. So this movie is about two hours and ten minutes. It's it's literally two, almost two hours and ten minutes long. And honestly, I think the pacing is brilliant. Like su- superhero movies and movies nowadays are becoming too long. Like I didn't go see Oppenheimer because it was three hours long. But I feel that this movie really did a great aspect of like two hours, get in, get out. Great dynamic. I think the third act. Become definitely becomes the cliche superhero movie towards the end, but I think that was needed. But I because it establishes so much in the first two acts of the movie. Uh, but I do think the pacing was really good for the film. Now let's talk about some of the criticisms for the film. So obviously we mentioned it very briefly at the beginning with the villains, but Susan Sarandon's character and Rahul Max uh, Trulio as uh, Ignacio Carapax or the Omac, um, and her as Victoria Cord, they are very, they are very one note evil, evil, evil. Uh, villains. I do think that um, Ignacio's uh, Carapax's character, uh, Rahul's character, does have definitely more to play with against Jaime, and I, that does play out quite well for the further it goes forward. But I do think, like, you know, when it comes out of this, like, well, to be fair, when you go back to Iron Man 1, you know, The Incredible Hulk, those villains were essentially just the op- the polar opposite of the, you know, you know, you had um, Iron Iron. Um, Iron Monger, you had the Abomination, you had like Loki. Loki always became a different thing later on, but you had these villains who are essentially the yin and yang, the counterpoint to the main hero. It kind of plays into this movie, to be honest. I do like how they did it. I I think the VFX work in most part. You can tell this isn't a stupidly high budget superhero movie, but that I think that's not a bad thing at the end of the day because you are here to see this film for the family, and it's a fun superhero film. That's just what it means at the end of the day. It's fun. You know, it's fun. It's emotional. It's driven. See this movie. It's coming out on digital in a few weeks' time or check it out in the cinema where you still can. Again, like, I do highly recommend this film. Like, I've been waiting to see this film for quite a while. Obviously, it was going to be TV. You know, to film. I was quite happy that happened. Obviously, we didn't get Batgirl in the end, which I'm still quite frustrated by, to be honest. Um, the one downside of this film is that basically, like, you know, when we go to Rotten Tomatoes, like, for the scores... Like, we literally have some great scores for this film. Like, so it's like a 78 certified fresh by critics, but it's got a 92% by audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. And, you know, this is the first, well, I say it's the first. If anyone can correct me out there, this is one of the first Latino led superhero movies. Like, yeah, sure, I think Sherlock definitely leads it quite well. And I can't wait to see what they do next, to be honest. Metacritic, I think, if you go to Metacritic, has a different score because I think there's the whole Snyder. You know the Snyder fans and everything they do, they just don't like this movie because this is the, this is the limbo movie and I think that's what's hurt the box office to a degree because this movie has only made a hundred and five million dollars worldwide it only had a budget of one hundred and four so it's literally only made its budget back and I think the problem is though is that at the end of the day the budget it's quite frustrating because I think if this had if this didn't have the drag of the the DC mix up that is going on it would have done much better. I think, like, you know, people are confused what's going on. Also, a lot of people just don't want to go to the cinema at the moment still. Like, you know, we, we, we're using cinema now. It's like the highest box office. But, you know, we had Barbie, $1.4 billion, you know, dollars and everything. And But Blue Beetle makes $100 million, so they think it's a failure. But if you if you ask a lot of people who've seen this film, they wouldn't count it as a failure. They'd count it as a really brilliant movie. Like, it's fun. It's, you know, it's, it's new. It's fresh. Well, it's not. It's not. It's not fresh. There are superhero trips that have been have done so many times, but I think it's fresh in the degree like it's something different to this degree of like family dynamic and the main character. And like I, I do think going forward, if they can definitely implement some aspects of the Young Justice TV show, I think that would be a grander scale for the like the DCU going forwards. I don't think you could do it in one Blue Beetle movie. Maybe build up to it, like a mini End Game event essentially, or like a Winter Soldier approach. Uh, but yeah, no, I think we're going to wrap it up there for the review, though. Like, I will say the music is great in this film, actually. Do a big shout out to the music very briefly. But what score am I going to give this? I think I'm going to give this an 8.5 out of 10. No, I think I'm giving it a 0.5 because 
I, I really do appreciate what the movie did with the VFX, like, the, you know, the constraints they had. I do like the fact that they used a lot of practicality in the movie. Shola Maradonia is going to be a big actor. You know, he was he's obviously big in Cobra Kai, but I can't wait to see what he does next outside of this movie, if he goes to something completely different. The villains are quite weak, um, but hopefully that, you know, improves as we go forward. And obviously we can go into the DC going forward, and I can't wait to see what happens next. There are two post credit scenes, I believe, for this film. Oh, no, sorry. There's a, yeah, there's a mid credit scene for this film. I won't tell you what it is, but it does lead into what possibly can happen next. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give that a 8.5 out of 10. Oh, so that was the first review, people. Uh, it's quite different to actually do that by myself. But I think we're going to take a little break, a little break after this uh, slight bit of pause. We'll come back for our TMNT review. It'll probably be a bit shorter than this one. But see you in a minute, folks. Bye-bye. <laughs> And welcome back, everyone, to the second portion of the uh, review part of the episode. For the second review we're going to be doing now, which is TMNT, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, directed by Jeff Rowe, a screenplay by Seth Rogen, produced by Seth Rogen, and honestly, like, and Evan Goldberg, uh, starring uh, Mika Abbey, uh, Shaman Brown Jr., Nicholas Katu, Brady Noon, Ayu Adebayo, Adebiri, May Roundov, John Cena... Whole bunch of actors, Ice Cube as well, Jackie Chan. This this is a star-studded cast of a movie, honestly. Like when this movie first got announced, I was like, oh, I mean, we just we we're currently going through like a TMNT animated phase as well. Check out Paramount Plus if you want to check that out. It's a really good series, two D animation show. But when this was first announced, I was like, okay, Seth Rogen doing a, a TMNT show. A lot of people were like, okay, what could actually happen here? But uh, the way I see it is basically Seth Rogen has been on a roll in recent years. So Invincible, The Boys, Preacher. Like the man has been on a really creative role. And the fact he's decided to come out and like, you know, do this movie. Also, you know, this the, the what was it? The promo basically from the permanent teenage mind of Seth Rogen or something like that. Like he, this man seems like he actually does know what he's talking about in regards to this film series. Obviously, you know, if you have been under a rock all these years, you will know about, if you don't know about TMNT, it's about a bunch of teenagers who are mutants, but they also happen to be Ninja Turtles. And it came out in like 1984, and it was like this worldwide phenomenon. Obviously, it became hugely popular when the 90, 1987 animated show came out, which was pretty much where a lot of us came to know the turtles but a lot of people don't realize that the turtles actually had a quite dark origin to be honest like when they were first conceptualized it was a much darker tone like more reminiscent of like daredevil and that time period and everything but when the animated show came out they decided that they wanted to try something different so that's when the approach of like the more light-hearted cowabunga dude slices of pizza like approach came out which i thought was really interesting like back in the day i thought you know there's these turtles that walk fucking awesome and obviously over the years we've had multiple iterations of this we've had multiple animated shows the live action movies in regards to the puppetry masters which i still think are the greatest to this day i mean go ninja go ninja go which by the way like i love the fact that even though that song came out in the 90s with vanilla ice they are still using it to this day. I, I think like it's a it's a very cheesy song for a film, but I think it works out quite well. But coming back to this film though, like when it was like first conceptualized of what this movie was gonna be, like it was an origin story of the Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles, it was actually gonna be proper teenagers, because in previous iterations it's always been adult male actors in the vo vocal role. It's never been pure teenagers. Where Seth Rogen decided in this time around, no, we want actual teenagers playing the part. So this is where we get the likes of Mika Abbey, uh, Shaman Brown, Nicholas Katu, Brandy Noon as Donatello, Michelangelo, Leonardo and Raphael. So how do they play out in this movie as teenagers? Pure and simple, they literally are goofy teenagers who are like you know, have anger issues, they also have, like, stupid, you know, they could be so smart one minute, so stupid the next, like, constantly try, like, self-doubting themselves, the complex nature of the world around them, just wanting to be different, wanting to be normal, because obviously, you know, these are mutants who've grown up in a sewer, but they just want to be kids who just want to hang out with other kids, but it just doesn't happen. Now, speaking of, like, being raised in the sewer, this movie brings us Jackie Chan as Master Splinter, or just splinter with this movie. Uh, I like. I actually really liked him in the movie, to be honest, because 
when it came to like his portrayal, uh, it's been quoted as like they wanted to portray him more of a, you know, one of those uh, schloppy dads sort of thing. Uh, so he wears like sweatpants in the movie, and he has like this you know, funky hairstyle, and obviously he's just trying to do the best for his boys. But for the boys themselves, though, I think each of them has a great character of personality for each of them. Like obviously, you know, Leonardo is trying to be the there is the goody two shoes, but he's he's self doubting himself. You have Raphael, who's the uh, the hot head, which is both a positive and a negative for him. You have Michelangelo, who's the goofy Lucy type, but he's got this hidden like talent among him. And then you got um, Donny, who is obviously the technician of the group, and he is constantly he's just in a, in a wonderment of the world, a wonderment, amazed at the world basically. Now I think like watching the movie you definitely feel the dynamic between these characters like you they de- you definitely feel that they could be brothers and it was stated like by Seth Rogen in a few interviews that during the recording process he actually had most of the voice actors who were working together in scenes vo- uh, you know voice those scenes together which created a more relaxed environment a more like natural environment for these people to do the vocal recordings for and it really plays into the film, like, honestly, like, when these characters are acting, when these characters are talking to each other, it just feels natural, which I think is really awesome. Obviously, you know, bring in the likes of um, Ayo Adabiri as April O'Neil, you'll probably know her most recently from The Bear, and uh, she does a great portrayal of April O'Neil in this movie. Uh, she is trying to essentially, like, make her name in the world in more ways than one. I don't want to spoil it, but it definitely plays into the movie that well. And her first interaction of the turtles is quite unique because the way she explains it and how their first interaction, you think, oh, wait, no, that kind of works out, to be honest. But I won't go into spoilers for that, but it's a really interesting way of going about it. Now, it comes, we come to the film, the villains, the villain of the film, or like the the people that are like swaying the turtles to a degree, and that's Ice Cube as Superfly. Um... Honestly, like, he is a mutant, uh, he's a mutant fly who's leading a bunch of mutants and he wants to, like, you know, make it, make his, himself known but also make sure his mutants are safe. How that goes about in the film, it's fair. But also, like, you know, Ice Cube does a great portrayal of, like, Ice Cube just is a great actor in general, but I think when it comes to this film, like, playing up against the Turtles, the dynamic there, he, whereas the Turtles, he, they've not really been in society, they've not, like, seen part of society, Superfly, he has seen the ugly part of society, basically. So it's that dynamic going on there. Do the do the do the team and T boys get uh, twisted into helping him, or does it go a different way? Uh, the f- interesting thing is though, like when it comes to like the all the rest of his crew, there's such a star-studded cast. You have John Cena as Rocksteady, Seth Rogen as Bebop, Paul Rudd as Mondo Gecko, Hannibal Barris as Genghis Frog, Post Malone as Ray Filet. Uh, Natasia and Demetrio as Wingnut, like all these people are part of his gang, and they the art design in this film is spectacular. We'll go into the more art specifically more in a second, but the art design for these mutants is really good and it's very unique. And I love how the narrative plays into their their journey as well. Like they may have a much smaller journey than Superfly and the the boys and everything, but and even even Splinter to a point. But they have a minor journey as well, which I think plays out quite well into the movie. So let's go on to the art style and animation for the film. So obviously using the old magic of Wikipedia, turns out that the animation was done by uh, Mick Cross Animation in Montreal and Paris and Cinecite in Vancouver. But also, so the director, Roe, actually did Mitchell's vs. the Machines, which, by the way, if you've not seen that film, definitely check it out. It's on Netflix or whichever channel you could possibly get it on. It's a brilliant family movie. And I think... That's actually hits in the nail on the head there. And, you know, Roe has done like you know, multi, has, has done multiple animated movies about family now, and he definitely understands the dynamic when it goes into that. So just take a look here. He's literally directed. Oh, so he was a co-director on on the Mitchell's vs. Machines apolog- apologies, and he's also done Gravity Falls and Charmin. But yeah, he did a great job with Mitchell's vs. the Machines. Highly recommend checking out. But when it comes to this film, though, he does mention about how like you know. Into the spot when when it comes to animation now, Into the Spider Verse has essentially led this new animation revolution, like trying to create unique designs, trying to push animation limits to above its limits, going beyond its limits essentially. And I feel that this film does that in its own right. So whereas uh, it's quoted here somewhere, I'm just trying to look for the quote now. Uh, just, uh, Roe described the films as more of as a North style, in which like he takes the art concept of like 
sketchbook design. Like he actually like asked his artist to be not as like embrace the imperfections, draw like teenagers, like make it more sketch based and more like clay. Des- it feels like there's a claymation element to this movie as well, which oil painting, claymation, sketchbook design is very it's very frantic. It's not refined. And this world is slightly more chaotic in that respect. Like it's it's mayhem. It's a mayhem to a degree. And I think the art style is really unique to this movie because obviously with Spider-Verse, that leans more towards the more comic book like inspired looks. Every un- every character has a unique design, whereas in uh, unique design to their multiverse or their universe. Whereas in TMNT, it really does play into that quite well. And I think the art design is brilliant for this film. Uh, so yeah, definitely points on that part. Speaking of the runtime people, like this movie is one hour and 40 minutes long, like a hundred minutes long. Perfect, perfect time. Like literally you get in, the movie starts going and it's a case of awesome. We are, we've got the story out of the way. We know where we are. We know where we're going. And I think it's a great, the pacing of the movie is really good. I will give this the movie. My... I get, I've done a lot of negative. I've done a lot of positives for this movie, but I do have a few negatives, or um, not not true negatives to a degree. But whereas into the Spider Verse, we got a very unique story and like the the growth of these characters. I think the character portrayals of like each of the turtles is brilliant. I think a lot of the character portrayals in the movie are really good, but I think the narrative is the downside. To be honest, in regard to like, it's it's quite generic to a point. Like it's. Heroes build up, fight the villain, end of story. There's no, there's no difference. There's no shock factor. But I guess with like a movie with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it's for kids. You you, you don't want to you know overcomplicate the story to a, to a degree. But I just know I just think with Spider Verse and we we've been treated to such unique animated narratives, including a film called Nimona. Highly, highly recommend checking that out as well. I think we've been like very unique and like how we well we've done with animated movies recent in recent years with their narratives Mitchell vs. the Machines which is another one to say now this isn't actually going like you know a huge downfall for the movie it's still a really fun film like it's a really really fun movie and also they've announced that they have confirmed a sequel and also a 2D animated two season uh, show on Paramount which links between season one and two which I'm very interested in seeing and I do like when animated shows actually link to uh, the animated films specifically, um, yeah, specifically when it comes to, uh, How to Train a Dragon. How to Train a Dragon was a perfect example, um, like, in regards to, like, how it had multiple different shows, but it also linked to the movies between one and two and two and three really well. By the way, if you've never seen that film series, go ahead, like, purely, purely go ahead and watch it. It's absolutely stunning. Like, my one of my favourite film trilogies of all time. But yeah, I think the narrative in this film is is fun. It's it's not over, overly complicated. I think that's what that's what raises it up a bit more because even though it's like you could you could have a two hour animated film and the story is very basic. And you, you might get you might drift off a bit. You might you might lower your review scores because if nothing unique is happening and you're in the cinema for that long, what's the point? Whereas I think this movie creates a nice balance between its pacing and its narrative. So if you take the idea, if you take the concept of like, well, if the movie's constantly going, the the pay, you know, the narrative may not be amazing, but there's always something going on. There's always an interesting aspect to it. It may not be fun, unique, original, but it's still fun nonetheless. So I think, um, like, if you get the chance, I believe this is out on digital now, so you can purchase on digital. So definitely watch it. If this is a film like you know for a Sunday evening, uh, you know, and getting out there wanting to watch something unique. Uh, with a family, or if you want to go to the cinema, because I believe this is still running in cinemas, I highly recommend checking this movie out. So yeah, honestly, I can't wait to see Seth Rogen does next, because he is he's on a roll at the moment. Obviously, we have Invincible Season 2 coming out soon in November, well, part Season 2, Part 1, um, so that will be really interesting to see. And I can't wait to see where the Team NT goes next, because just forewarning, there is a post credit scene. We do know where this franchise is going after that. And I'd love to see the aspect of teenagers, not adult, adult playing teenagers, teenagers fighting what is coming next. So I think I'm going to give this movie a 7.5 out of 10. Yeah, I gave uh, Blue Beetle an 8.5 because I think even though Blue Beetle, like, had this, had had more, had, uh, again, it's interesting fam because all the stuff we're going to be talking about today, there's a lot of heart and a lot of family built into it. But I think Blue Beetle, I it just ups it a little bit for me. And also, it was trying something a 
bit more different for DC. I think like after the stuff we've had from DC, it's 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 nice to have something fresher. Whereas TMNT, it seems we are still getting the roughly the same story, which I'd like something different. So yeah, I'm gonna give this a seven point five out of ten. It's still a great movie. Go check it out. Definitely watch it. And uh, yeah, it's it's an hour and a half. People, go check it out. Right. Anyway, after that, we are now going to take a short break again, and we are going to go into our final review for the day, which is going to be Netflix's One Piece. Right, people, so it seems you are here for the final review of the uh, podcast episode today, which is going to be Netflix's One Piece. How do we start this off? Netflix has been on a roll in recent years, and a roll in adaptations. Now, I sound positive when I say that, but oh no, 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 no. They really have missed the mark with a lot of their anime adaptations and really did make me worried because obviously we have The Last Airbender show coming out in 2024 and obviously we also have My Hero Academia, which is supposed to be coming out as well. And we just recently had Cowboy Bebop. Now, Cowboy Bebop was, I believe we gave that a 6 or a 7 on NMI because I feel that whereas the while the actors did, I don't know, they... They did feel like they put all the heart into it. The show was just very... It wasn't shot well. It looked very setty is the term I like to use. The actual, like, the narrative changed a lot from the anime, which is interesting because we'll talk about the adjustments in the One Piece anime here as well. But going into Want Cowboy Bebop, it just didn't feel... Cowboy Bebop was supposed to be more of a serious, like... I believe a more serious anime... Uh, whereas, whereas One Piece is more of a light-hearted anime until time goes by. I just want to get from the forefront here that people, I've only seen the first 30 episodes of One Piece. I wanted to try and catch up to a point where I could sort of understand the show from a basic, from the first episode to roughly, I'd say, halfway or two-thirds of the way to the point where they had ad- ad- adapted the show though to be fair though they have readjusted a lot of the narratives going into the show with a bit of research we've done i would have loved to get like a one piece expert on i'm thinking maybe we might do a like a an episode of talking about anime adaptations and what goes right and what goes wrong and what could be done to improve them and i think one piece will be a center point of that and i think getting a one piece expert on would be really good to have to be honest so yes netflix how did they do with the one piece new live action show outright great how did they pull this off i could tell you how they pulled it off it was a uh, ilchi oda ilchi Il- Il- i'm trying to pronounce his name correctly pronounce his name correctly so ichiro oda so the reason behind this is he was pretty much involved with everything casting reshooting he was making sure that everything was directed correctly like everything was to his vision and i think that's where other adaptations have failed because i remember reading an article from the creator of um cowboy bebop he saw the first scene of cowboy bebop and went no just no this isn't cowboy bebop and i'm wondering why he wasn't involved was he involved in the show did they not just take his advice or heed his advice because let's you know bring it back a bit one piece is from what I understand, it is one of the biggest animes out there. Like, just w- one of the biggest animes out there in general. It is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's like one of the best-selling manga of all time. It's been running since 1997, I want to say. Um, so, ni- sorry, 1999. So, two years after Pokemon. So, this show has been going for almost 20, 25 years now. Which is an achievement to itself. It's still not finished. Though they have stated that... Like, the manga is finally entering its final arc, which I'm, you know, I'm presuming, like, when you've done this for 25 years, you finally want to figure out what the One Piece is, which, by the way, they still haven't figured out in the anime, people. They still haven't figured out what the One Piece is. So coming to this Netflix adaptation, everyone was apprehensive. Everyone was going, you can't do this. You can't, you, how are you going to make a pirate, mo- a pirate show about a stretchy boy and a guy who holds three swords, one in his mouth, and, like all these different characters and how are you going to make it crazy bombastic visually visually artistically strong they did they pulled it off and do you know how they did that it's weird. it's annoying to say money and money and understanding of the show because i believe also when it came to the creation of the show uh because it was actually created by i'm just trying to look for it now uh so uh, just trying to look for the name now basically 
turns out that one of the producers or basically like one of the creators he stated like he watched this growing up and he really grew an appreciation for the show and it was only after like um he spoke to Oda I believe that or he spoke to the Netflix and talked about like the understanding for it that he it was the passion behind the role he knew what this show needed and I, I love that like I think if you have someone who truly understands the source material and also brings the creator in it gives you that sort of like strong backing that no one's going to step down you're not going to be able to create you're not going to be able to turn the show from what it is into what it's something it shouldn't be and from both one piece fans and non one piece fans are like everyone is praising the show because one piece fans are understanding of like you can change the source material like there's a narrative where basically a character called kobe um he is in the first episode but he has stuff like 700 episodes down the line that you don't meet him for a long time that they bring into the first season to create the sort of parallel between him and luffy and their progression to be the best marine and to be the best pirate now we get other characters within this as well and obviously with one piece it's about uh, let's you know go back a bit it's about a character called luffy who has this devil fruit power where he can stretch himself he's played by inyaki Gotti, um and honestly this guy has when he talks, like, he has the energy of Luffy. Uh, I'd Google the YouTube video people, uh, Luffy meets Luffy, and also Luffy meets the creator. And the creator, like, was involved in the casting process, and he literally stated, like, you you are, you are Luffy. And, you know, the guy, he tears up, like, he he feels the passion for this character. And it's like, it's in the, it's in the veins of, like, Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, Tom Holland as, um, you know, Spider-Man, Henry Cavill as when, when he was Superman. Like, it, it's these, and also when he was Geralt of Rivia. These people have a passion for a character. They, they put their all into it. And I think when you watch the show, he puts his all into it. Like, a lot of people will say he's not as bombastic or over the top as Luffy from the anime. But people are understanding from the anime and also from like the live action, you can't go too far. You can, in certain aspects, you can't go full anime because you just can't do it. So I think adapting it to an interesting point works out really well. So let's talk about some of the other characters. Emily Red is Nami, who's sort of like the, the new, the thief and everything. She has this interesting past with another character in the anime, which we won't talk about for spoiler reasons. But initially, she just seems like, um, you know, this sarcastic character who just who just doesn't give a damn. And she just wants out for gold or something specific. And she's just out for herself. She has an interesting character dynamic as the show goes on. All these characters get deeper as time goes by. Then we uh, go on to uh, Makenyu, um, who is a Japanese actor. Uh, he is, his name is, he plays um, Roronara Zoro. A, he's a bounty hunter, a pirate bounty hunter, and a master swordsman. And he actually fights with three swords, one in his mouth. Yes, that's true, people. He fights with one sword in his mouth. Now, for his character specifically, I do want to cut off to the point of choreography in this movie and um, the fight scenes. Whereas other anime, you get like very close up shots, you don't know what's going on. Other shows have had this issue as well. In One Piece, you do essentially get clear cut shots. You get this amazing choreography. Uh, McKenyu, has, as you came out, stated he wanted to do as many stunts as he could. Like, I believe he did pr pretty much all his own stunts in the film, with some exceptions for the more extreme stunts. Don't verify me that. I believe I read an article, but I believe that's true. And he does a great portrayal in this character as well. He. He brings a sort of like calm essence to the character, but such a cool, suave facade. And like, then he becomes such a badass later on. Excellent portrayal in the movie. And he has some interesting dynamics to why he wants to be the best master swordsman in the world. Now, we do get, which is interesting for the show, we get like a format where basically it's like, you meet Luffy, you find out his backstory, and then you get eight episodes of the show. It's meet a new character, learn backstory. Meet a new character, learn backstory. And basically, it's it's filling out this crew. It's filling out the Straw Hat crew, which I think is really needed for this type of show because for the love and appreciation of these characters, people want to know what these characters, have, you know, what drives these characters and how people can become, in, you know, engrossed in, or so become enamoured with these characters, become love them, become part of their family, essentially. And honestly, I think that finally like set, sets in when we get to the characters of Usopp and Sanji, played by Jacob Romero Gibson and Taz Skyler. So Usopp is more like this, like he he's more the comedic aspect of the group. He's a marksman. He is an inventor. 
Uh, he has an interest dynamic with another character in the show. Uh, we won't go into too many spoilers, but he he bring he brings the more comedic element to the show. Really, him and Luffy play off together really well. But when it comes to the serious aspect, he does have some serious scenes as well, which works out really well. And then we come to Tasuka like Sanji. A lot of people love this guy. Like he he's originally supposed to be French in the adaptation because basically. When it came to the nationalities of the show, um, Oda has actually stated that he actually actually written each character's origin. So I believe like Luffy is Brazilian, so he has he is played by a um, I'm trying to get his uh, he is played by a, well he's played by um, uh, a Mexican actor in the show. Um, uh, Nami is supposed to be Swedish. Uh, uh, Zoro is supposed to be Japanese. Um, so Usopp is supposed to be from South Africa, and Sanji is supposed to be France. Now it's interesting because um, in the show, Sanji has more of a, uh, a British. He's he's more of a British character, and more suave. Well, he thinks he's suave, uh, <laughs> and uh, but he's the chef of the group. But he's also like a martial artist. Now he has an in- interesting dynamic because we go to a um, we have a couple of episodes set on a, a ship. You may see it from the trailers. It's like a restaurant ship. And it's interesting uh, dynamic with a character from that. So when it comes to the, when it comes to this crew together and how they build up their relationships, I think it really plays into the show. You can definitely feel it. So let's talk about some of the other characters. I'd like to talk about Buggy the Clown, voiced by Jeff Ward. And people might know him from the later seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, this guy, when I first saw the anime and I was like, oh my god, this guy cuts himself up into tiny tiny pieces and he can fling himself about and how this goes i honestly don't know how they're going to pull this off he has a whereas um inaki uh does a great portrayal of the an energetic luffy enthusiastic luffy buggy is just crazy to a point he he's he's over the top he's crazy he's but it's not to the point where it's annoying it's to the point where you could really appreciate the actor's devotion like the passion he's putting into the character and his dynamic against Luffy works out really well because he has a dumber connection to Luffy as well, which is quite awesome. And then we get to um, the Marines. We, sp- we spoke about um, Morgan Davis's Kobe briefly, um, a character who meets uh, Cabin, Boy in Pir- uh, Cabin Boy in the Pirates, and then uh, Luffy rescues him, and he uh, eventually joins the Marines because his dream is to be a Marine. Now... Go, as we mentioned earlier, supposedly, from what I've researched, Kobe doesn't reappear for a long time. And this is like after a massive time skip. And he's more of a successful Marine by this point. But for the purpose of the show, they decided to change things around and bring him back. So you can. So Luffy wants to be the greatest, the world's greatest pirate, king of the pirates. Um, Kobe wants to be the world's greatest Marine. Or just, just a great Marine who helps people. And it's an interesting yin-yang, it's an interesting balance between these two of how that plays out. How that goes throughout the show, sometimes it can be a little bit cheesy. Like, I'm not going to lie, there are some lines which could be adjusted slightly. I do think, specifically with him and, you know, character his... um... Now, in the first episode, you do get, like, uh, his reservedness, his nervousness. But I do think, as time goes by, you start to see the cracks away of that, that chipping away to bring the, like the unreserved not the unreserved but like the the powerful kobe to the front the the passionate kobe the the, the, gonna stand on their own feet essentially now as we go by eventually what happens is vincent reagan comes in as a character called vice admiral garp and he is determined to catch luffy and the pirate and the straw hat crew and kobe gets pulled into that now Garp plays an interesting role in the show. I think he portrays it really well. Um, I, I'm looking forward to see where it goes next with him as well. I, I do think, like, if you come into the show expecting really serious characters, really serious villains, you are not going to like it. I think, like, you are not going to like the show. If, if you want, like, really serious pirate, no. If you come to the show thinking it's comedy Pirates of the Caribbean or, like, more energetic, over-the-top Pirates of the Caribbean, you will really enjoy it, to be honest. And I think, like... I'm hoping, really hoping this gets a second season, to be honest, because. That's right, people. That is right. We got a second season for the show. Obviously, I had to do a quick interjection here. Obviously, this episode was recorded before the second season got announced, but they did it, people. Netflix's One Piece did it. They broke the Netflix curse with an anime. They're finally getting a second season. And boy, can we cannot wait to NMI to actually see this. But yeah, just want to do a quick brief intro, uh, a brief 
interlude there, people, just to let you know we are aware of this at NMI and it's recorded beforehand. Anyway, back to the rest of the episode. Like, it's... From what the news we're talking about, it's beaten... So it was the top show in 84 countries, beating Stranger Things Season 4 and Wednesday. Uh, it's, it has dropped to number two in a couple of countries just because of one movie. But a lot of people are stating that's probably because everyone has wanted to watch it in the first weekend, which means the metrics put at the top, and now it's gone down a little bit. But no doubt people might, you know, it might come back to number one next week, and, you know, we'll see what happens there. Now, it's been said that the season two scripts are written, they're ready to go, but they're literally waiting for the writer's strike to end. As soon as the writer's strike finishes, they'll, they, it will be out within 12 months as soon as the writer's strike finishes. 12 months to 18 months, it'll be out. Now, in the anime, obviously the show's been going for almost 20 years by this point, and Luffy is supposed to still be in like early 20s by that point. I think what's going to happen is like they're going to start trying to work out how to condense the show even more because I don't think we're going to we're going to get 20 seasons of the show. I could see maybe eight or nine seasons, maybe 10 at a push. Now, I think if we have about 20 seasons of an anime, like it is literally 20 seasons at the moment. I know they the way they wrote it, like they, they do the East Blue arc uh, for the um, for the show, which is about the first 50 to 60 episodes. Now, if they can condense that even more, like, or, or just, like, work out a way to condense it, I think you could have an interesting point there. Or maybe one or two seasons have two more episodes, just to fill that gap in, essentially, as long as the pacing works. Because, by the way, I've seen some of the characters that are coming up, and this show had an $18 million budget per episode. And it shows. It really does show for some aspects of it, especially for the VFX and the fighting. It also does definitely prove... The stretchy aspect can be done correctly. So there's hopes for Mr. Fantastic and Marvel, yeah. But going forward, there are characters I don't know how you're going to do it in live action. Like, you could possibly do it. Like, I'm looking at stuff like Detective Pikachu. Um, what else do we have? Um, Pirates of the Caribbean is a good example, specifically Dead Man's Chest. Um, and also um, uh, World's End, uh, Bill Nye's character. But... Yeah, I don't know how it's going to go going forward. And also, I've seen some of the more recent anime stuff. I, you know, Twitter and everything. And people think Dragon Ball is insane. I watched the start of One Piece, and I spoke to a few people about this. The latest anime is fucking insane. Like, they have, like, inspired by Looney Tunes level insane. And I'd, I'd love to see how they could translate that into live action. I'm hoping to God... That basically everyone has loved this show. Like, that's the thing. It's getting praise from mostly everywhere. It's getting seven to eights to nines. Some people are giving it tens even. Like, just for the pure appreciation of what they've put into this show. But I'd like, I'd, yeah, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it gets a second season. Like, and it's ready to go. And I'm hoping, like, we get to see where these characters are going to go. Because they do, it, it does end on sort of like a chapter like it's like the first chapter is over so what i'm guessing is they will be doing like each chapter as the show goes by because the next so we looking at wikipedia at the moment we have season one which is 60 episodes which is probably the first season and season two three and f season two and three of the anime are only uh 30 episodes and then season four is 39 episodes so that's 69 episodes right you could do the next four, three seasons in one Netflix show, possibly. I, ha I haven't seen that far in the show. I may be wrong there, so I, if, if I am, please correct me, people. I'd, I would love to get questions and, like, you know, responses to this and see what people think. But I do think, like, working it out, a thousand episodes, if you could dent 60 into a season... You know, you could you could work it out that way. Maybe create some movies as the time goes by, because I know they have One Piece movies, and just see how it goes. But my rating for this show, hmm. So I gave Blue Beetle an 8.5. I gave Team and T a 7.5. Do you know what? I'm going to give this a 9. Like, I really had fun with this show. Like, I, I, I didn't know, I didn't hugely know One Piece going into this. I tried watching some of the anime. It is dated now, by the way, like four by three ratio dated, like, and it's quite frustrating because for some reason, Crunchyroll doesn't allow the English dub outside of America, Canada and Australia. I believe it's Australia. But for some reason, Europe still only have the Japanese dub. I'm more of a, oh, sorry, the Japanese uh, dub. I'm more of an English dub person because I 
prefer watching the visuals of a show so I could just listen in my own language. I know the whole sub dubs argument. Don't get me wrong. I do enjoy subs. I love Squid Game. I love you know watching stuff like that. But I just think when it comes to visual like animated films, I prefer English dub. But yeah, I'm going to give this a 9 and I can't wait to see where it goes next, honestly. When it comes to One Piece, I'm hoping we eventually find out what the One Piece is, but also we get not just One Piece, but 10 pieces of pure gold for each season for this show. So yeah, that's my review of One Piece. Definitely go check it out, people. It's eight episodes, maybe an hour to 40 minutes to an hour an episode. And just get out of the way and get it and crush it there. So that's it, people. We have done three reviews in one episode. I've never done this before. I've done two reviews, but not three, especially a single episode as well. And hopefully, you know, you possibly like this dynamic or, you know, maybe you just want to change it back to, like, you know, multiple people so we get good discussion points. But maybe you just, maybe also you prefer these shorter reviews as well, with no spoiler section, so you can go in fresh for your own eyes. Please let us know this, but any comments as well, by emailing us at nmipodcastoutlook.com. That's nmipodcastoutlook.com. Or search for our Twitter and Instagram at nmicast. Uh, we've got some interesting shows coming up still. We are looking at doing the retro show. Uh, we do have some. We also, also will finally be getting around to reviewing the bear. So I know myself and Chaz um, are definitely looking forward to doing that. Chaz has actually already finished the show. I haven't, so which is a first for me. So I'm actually going to try and finish that show as soon as possible so we can review that. Movies-wise, though, we're actually quite dry for september to be honest we might start reviewing some games possibly with um currently playing starfield boulders gate um we also have spider-man 2 coming out in about five six weeks time alan wake assassin's creed all these great titles coming out and if you got if you actually got like any suggestions of some episodes we can do please email, email those into us or like you know maybe we'll, maybe we'll do a quiz again soon like if you've got any quiz ideas please um, email those into us and we'll we'll play that quiz on the show but anyway right i've been your host nate people you stay safe everyone bye-bye <laughs>